<laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay, Thank cool. You. So Appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, so awesome. Uh, we are so excited to have our study club today and have Christy Gilmore here, who works with Fort Law, who is an amazing um, uh, facility for you guys that, uh, you know, really supports people like us because we don't know all the ins and outs of employment law like we probably should. Uh, and I just don't have the time or bandwidth to read it all up on and be an expert in that. So that is essentially why we hire and bring on experts because um, it's just not possible to be an expert in everything. And so I spend my time learning as much as I can uh, about dentistry and operations. And then we you know, kick that over to... Um, the experts for the employment law. And I know that recently the employment field in dentistry has been full of landmines, let's put it that way. <laughs> and I've been finding it difficult to navigate uh, for the most part. And so we have had our share of uh, interesting situations uh, in dentistry. And I feel like it's not going to stop. And I feel like uh, dentistry in, in itself needs to be a lot more prepared. I think we're a little bit behind the eight ball in most things, and especially in this kind of area, which is why we like to bring on Christy to kind of give us a little bit of the lay of the land of of some things today. And yeah, I think you have a little bit of a presentation that you're going to go through and give us a rundown. And I might just intercede and ask a lot of questions. Uh, sure. And if anyone's in the chat, then they can you know, throw, throw, throw something in the chat and uh, I'll ask those questions as well and we'll get them answered for you. Right. I'll turn the okay. time over to you, Christy. Thank you. Thanks very much and thanks for having me. I'm mm -hmm. just going to um, share my screen quickly here. Uh, hold on. Okay. Are you seeing, what are you seeing there? Uh, Let's do I'm that seeing again. your notes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want you to see this. Okay. So yeah. um, I'm going to talk today about um, employment contracts and setting your business up for success. Um, this is geared towards dental offices, but all of these principles can be applied generally to um, private employers across the board. Um, my over is not working. One second. I always like to start with a land acknowledgement. I am currently um, presenting from the traditional and ancestral and unceded territories of the Semiam, Kwantlen, Katsi, and Sawasan First Nations. I'm privileged to have grown up and been raised in uh, White Rock, BC, um, and uh, I'm very thankful for the lands that I get to walk on and enjoy every day. Um, just a little bit about me and my firm. So my firm is called Forte Workplace Law. All we do is uh, legal issues related to the workplace. We help employers and employees solve um, any workplace related issues from hiring to firing, everything in between. Um, the common things that come up are drafting or advising on employment contracts, policies, disciplinary docu documentation, termination documentation. Um, we draft them. We help, uh, you know, draft PIPs, performance improvement plans, things like that. Um, one of the things that comes up frequently for our dental clients is they're looking at potentially selling or buying uh, into a business and they want to know what uh, liabilities they might have to current employees. Um, and that's something that we do assessments of and give advice on. Uh, we negotiate and litigate workplace legal disputes, so most of the time we try to stop things before they become an issue. That's what I really enjoy. I really enjoy the advisory and preventative work, um, but it's not always possible. Sometimes you end up negotiating and sometimes you end up litigating, which means you've been sued or you end up going to court. And we have people who do that as well. That's I don't go to court very often, but I have colleagues who love it. Uh, we also provide training on policies. Everybody in BC should have a respectful workplace policy. It is a work safe requirement. We train people, we write them and we train people on them and what discrimination, bullying and harassment mean. People throw those ideas and concepts out all the time without actually understanding what they mean and what the tests are. Uh, so we do training on that. We also conduct workplace investigations where there's a dispute over whether or not something is bullying and harassment, for instance, um, and we me mediate disputes. Um, we are a firm that acts on both sides, so I act for employers and employees, and that means that 
I will literally have days where somebody comes in with an issue on the employer side, and then I have an employee come in with the exact same issue on a different file in the same day. And what that really helps with is understanding where the other side is coming from and what things might be um, useful to think about or uh, to know in negotiation. So for Forte Workplace Law, we do anything you can think of related to workplace employment dispute or avoidance, avoidance of disputes. Um, Disclaimer, what would a legal presentation be without a disclaimer? <laughs> um, <laughs> this is not specific legal advice on any specific issue. I can take questions and I'm happy to take questions. I love having a facilitated discussion where people jump in and ask me questions. It's always more interesting. Um, it's boring to hear myself talk all the time, um, <laughs> but I can't take specific questions about a specific situation because we do act for our employers and we do act for employees and we do act on both sides. We have to run conflict checks before I can give specific legal advice. So that's the big reason that I can't give specific information or specific answers to specific questions. Um, this is intended to be informational. Okay, so with that, why do people avoid employment contracts? Well, there's, I mean, procrastination, um, not getting around to it, not doing it, feeling like you don't need it. You know, the romance of the new hire is killed by a contract. Like, <laughs> you know, I like you, you like me, let's work together versus, okay, I want to make you an offer and here's all the terms. Um, people are afraid to uh, say all of the terms that they want or don't know how to say them all or don't have a good precedent. Um, tons of reasons why they're avoided, um, but they're all not, good reasons to avoid doing them. No matter how long you want to you end up working with someone, every employment relationship will eventually end. It's very rare that it ends because somebody dies. Um, most commonly somebody resigns and sometimes that resignation is for happy reasons. They're retiring, you know, they're moving on to something else, they're moving away, whatever. Sometimes it's because there's something going on at work that they don't want to deal with. Um, or there's someone they don't like at work or there's an issue uh, and sometimes they're fired. The employer just needs to let them go for whatever reason. Sometimes it's downsizing. Sometimes it's interpersonal conflict. Sometimes it's, um, you know, they're moving their practice towards something that is not in that person's skill set. Um, there's all sorts of reasons why people let go, uh, get let go. But the number one thing that a contract helps you with is it helps you avoid liability for severance. So handshake is great until there's a dispute because if you don't have a contract in writing that has specific terms and conditions that everyone has agreed to in advance and sign off on in advance, you can have huge liabilities. So your number one reason to have a good contract is to limit your liability and the number one liability that you can limit through a good contract is severance pay. Um, but there's all sorts of other things that you can tie off as well. Things like overtime, um, you know, making sure that you're paying people a proper, appropriately. One of the things that commonly comes up for my dentist clients is uh, averaging agreements. There's so many ways that you can go afoul of them. Um, so, you know, limiting liability. So let's talk about, um, I'll talk about that in a second, actually. There's also, anytime you have a contract, you're gonna reduce your likelihood of a dispute. So it sets clear expectations, which is beneficial for everyone. It's so much easier to agree in advance than when you're already fighting about something or it's unclear expectations about something. Setting those clear expectations and boundaries, the first thing that I tell people when they call me up with a problem is, what does your contract say about that? That yeah. is. That is the first thing. It's let's go to the contract and see if there's anything, you know, about those expectations. And if there is, that really helps guide the conversation and what you're going to do about it. Um, another benefit of employment contracts is if if you're a uh, practice owner and you're thinking about selling, having contracts will help people who want to buy your business know what potential liabilities are and they'll help you close off any loose ends. It is really helpful to know what the documentation says, to have that documentation when you're looking at buying or selling. 
One of the most shocking things I find about employment contracts is that they generally only include things that help the employee. They say, this is your pay, this is your benefits, this is your vacation, this is your sick time. We're so excited to have you welcome on board. And they don't say anything about, we expect these, we have these expectations of your duties, we have these expectations of your hours, we have these expectations of, um, you know, if, if, we have to let you go. We don't like thinking about that at the beginning of the relationship, but if it goes that way, we have to let you go. This is what we would, this is what we would pay you. And so many, so many contracts I see are lacking some of those basic things. So key contract clauses and why to include them. First one is a termination clause. Okay, and a termination clause should discuss what happens if you're being let go with cause. So for just cause, you're fired for reason then you're let go, you're not paid anything, the end, okay? <laughs> it should discuss what happens if you're let go without cause. So we don't have just cause to fire you, but we need to let you go because we're downsizing, for instance. So what does that look like? That looks like um, providing somebody with severance. Well, how much severance do you have to owe? Do you have to pay someone? That's probably the number one question that I've asked as an employment lawyer is, how much severance do we owe? Or how much severance am I owed? Or whatever. The first place that I look to see how much severance someone is owed is uh, the Employment Standards Act. Okay, the Employment Standards Act provides the bare minimums. I'm talking in BC. Um, every province has their own legislation, but you know uh, the Employment Standards legislation that's relevant to you. The second place I look is the contract because a contract can have a valid and binding termination provision that says you get the Employment Standards Act amounts. Or it could say something else. It could say something like you get a week per year of service plus, or you get a week plus a week per year of service, or you get a month plus a month per year of service, or you get two months plus two weeks per year of service to a maximum of four months. There's all different kinds of ways a termination provision can be structured, but there's lots of ways that it can be run afoul of what's required. So the first place I look to see how much notice is owed someone is the Employment Standards Act. Then I look at the contract. If the contract has a good valid binding termination provision, that could be it. You could owe them as little as whatever your contract provision says, which could be as little as whatever the Employment Standards Act requires. So what does that mean? The Employment Standards Act, owe, you owe an employee anywhere from zero to eight weeks, and how much you owe them is based on their length of service. When you look at the uh, contract, it could be anything. It could be whatever your contract says. You could have a contract that says you have to pay me five years pay. It's not likely, but it could happen. Or you could have a contract that says we owe you no severance. Well, that's not likely to be binding because it probably runs outside what the Employment Standards Act requires. Or you could have a termination provision that provides, you know, somewhere in the middle, you know, two weeks plus two weeks per year of service to a maximum of four months. So that could be binding. If that termination provision is not binding, it's no good for some reason or another, or you've somehow messed up implementing your contract, and we'll talk about that later, some ways that you can mess up implementing the contract. If you've somehow done that, then the kind of notice that people get is common law notice. Common law is judge-made law. It's judges looking at people like your employee, and trying to determine how much notice they need to replace their job. The purpose of notice is to give them a paid opportunity to look for work. The factors that the court looks at are their age, their years of service, their duties and responsibilities, and the availability of other employment. Those are the four key factors. Under the common law, for a without cause termination, you can owe up to 24 months of severance and in very limited circumstances even more than 24 months there's a soft cap at 24 months under the employment standards act you can owe a maximum of eight weeks so having a well-drafted termination clause can really limit your liabilities significantly the last thing that you should always have in your contract um, is a resignation provision for a, a, a termination clause is a resignation provision. And the reason that you want to have that is uh, you don't want somebody to resign and on no notice and leave you high and dry for a period of time. If they're a really key employee, you may have a longer notice period. People think, oh, it's two weeks. You have to give two weeks. Well, actually, you have to give whatever your contract says. 
So if you have a really key employee that you're going to need two months notice from, you can write that into the contract. OK. So. Uh, I just have a quick question, Christy. Yeah, I find that very interesting and I, I love that there is certain key roles in dentistry that that resignation would be very like crucial to like get locked down. Um, but that's, you know, is it, would it be typical, it would be difficult to uphold um, that resignation clause, I guess, if they're like not really a key employee, like obviously like your, o your OMs, your office managers, or your maybe like team leads, your clinical leads, I could see like them being respectful of that um, resignation clause, but like RDAs, like dental admin, like what is the likelihood of being able to uphold them to that? Like, well, I guess in the end, well, like, how are you going to say, well, actually, you have to give me two months notice? Well, I think, I think, you know, as an employer, what are your, what is your recourse if they don't do that? Okay. Mm -hmm. If they don't give you proper notice and it causes you to lose business, you could actually sue them over that. Okay. So if you're talking about a key higher level employee who leaves right before a deal is finalizing and the deal doesn't finalize because they left and didn't give you the key knowledge you needed to make the deal go ahead, you could have a claim against them for screwing up that deal for you. If you're talking about a, you know, dental hygienist or something who has a full caseload and their leaving means that you end up losing clients, potentially you could have a claim. OK, OK. Are you going to pursue that claim? Probably not. OK, but it, it's it's going to be a reputational hit for this person as well. It's probably going to affect your uh, desire to give them a good reference. Um, you know, pointing to it can help you manage the situation and say, look, contractually, you have to give us this. Mm -hmm. We need you to stay. Um, right. You know, it, like there's reasons to put it in. You may never go down the path of suing them or relying on it in that way, but it acts as a deterrent. Yeah. Okay. And That's it, kind it, of what I thought. And it gives them somewhere to go to know how much notice they have to give you when they're negotiating their new job. Yeah. And I think ideally it would be nice to see even clarify that in the beginning of that relationship, like you said. So it's like, oh, when they're planning it, it's like, oh, well, actually this is what yeah. you need to do. Okay. Exactly. And it just it if they're if they're looking to leave to new to go to a new employer and they're negotiating with their new employer and they tell their new employer actually I have a 1 month contractual notice clause, the new employer is probably going to look at that and go, "Oh good, they're actually listening to their contract." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? For if sure. they're if they're a smart employer, they're going to say, "Oh, okay, like that makes sense. That sucks for me. I want you to start right away, but like fair enough, right? Yeah. A good em yeah. that's how a good employer would handle it. So 100%. Okay. Um so key contract clauses and why to include them? Termination without uh, cause we've talked a lot about this already. Uh, this is the most common way that people are terminated is without cause. Even if you think you might have just cause, often people are fired without cause because the costs and challenges associated with firing someone for just cause are sometimes not worth it. You know the person's going to be trouble, you know there's going to be a whole bunch of issues, you have a good termination provision and you can let them go by giving them two weeks severance. Sometimes you just say, I'll give you the two week severance <laughs> rather than dealing with uh, cause termination. So it is the 100%. most common. <laughs> it is the most yeah. common way that you let people go. And if you have a good provision, you know, you can be 22 months in, in the green. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it basically converts this, the, you can convert a statutory floor of eight weeks to the ceiling of eight weeks. Okay. So some other key clauses and why to include them. Restrictive covenants. Uh, what is a restrictive covenant? A restrictive cover, covenant is something that says thou shalt not do this. <laughs> OK, it is a it is an employment term that says you can't do this or you can't do that. The most common restrictive covenants are a non solicitation clause, which is you can leave, but don't take our employees with you. OK, or a non competition clause that says you can't go work for a competing business or steal our our 
our patients for a period of time. The other most common one is a confidential information clause that says you're going to have learned confidential information about our business and you can't use it for your advantage or anyone else's advantage now or ever. Keep it confidential. OK, those are your most um, common restrictive covenants. Why do you want them? Well, um, I think most of that is pretty obvious. Um, non solicitation, uh, you don't want somebody to go away and take all of your employees with you. Um, non competition. And it happens. It so does. So much. <laughs> People leave a job, they have their little work buddies, and they take them all with them. And then you're high and dry, especially if, if there's like a bit of a, a you know, like, I would say human resources breakdown or maybe like a bit of like an inter-office issue yeah. going on. Like they'll take all of their friends with them. And it's, and I think like it's very interesting to me that how often this happens um, going from clinic to clinic and how much like if, if if there is a contract, I always or my someone's like if they're quitting because they'll be like, oh, Teresa, like I'm done here in a, in a week. Then I'll right. say, just OK, a reminder. <laughs> like just a reminder you can't talk about this, but if they don't have a contract, then it's like, it is what it is. And they walk out and they take everyone with them. Yeah. If they don't have a contract, unless they are a high level employee called a fiduciary, which is someone who is in a key position of power that can make decisions that would affect the bottom line of the company. So somebody like a director or officer is typically a fiduciary. Unless you're mm -hmm. someone like that, you can go compete or solicit the day you leave. Right. It's there's no there's no obligation not to do that. And in fact, the court and law encourages competition and encourages free trade. So uh, unless you have a contractual reason that you can't, you're allowed to do it. And the contractual reasons why you can't have to be drafted really well. So let's talk about that for a second. A non-competition clause, which is you can't go work in a competing business. These kinds of clauses are drafted all the time and they're also challenged all the time. And the reason they're challenged all the time is because the starting point at law is you're allowed to compete. The, the court wants to encourage people to go, you know, start businesses and work and be able to work in general. So the court has put tons of restrictions on these kinds of clauses. You can't just write something that says you can never go work for a com competitive business ever, period, the end. That's it. They have to be limited and the way these clauses have to be limited is in time, geography and scope. So a good non-compete will say something like for six months in the area 10 kilometers within 10 kilometers of our business, you can't uh, provide dental hygienist services. OK, it would be very, very specific and limited in all of those ways. Um, and you would want to also limit it to um, um, defining who they can't provide them to. Um, you want to be as specific as possible. So any patients that you dealt with while you were with our clinic. There's two real purposes to a non-compete clause. One of them is deterrence. So they have it, you're deterring them from acting in contravention of it. The second is enforceability. These clauses are often struck down because the court does like to encourage competition, um, but they can be enforceable and they can be uh, useful if you, for instance, have you know, someone break away and take half your pa patient list with you. So there are cases like that where, for instance, insurance brokers have broken off, started their own business and taken a million dollar book of business with them. Um, and then they've been sued for breaching their non-compete and they've had to disgorge all their profits, which means all the money they made goes to the people they stole the business from. <laughs> So that's, anyway, that's a lot. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. There's so, there's lots of asides on that. You're basically but. saying the more narrow the thing, the more the the better it is to uphold. Right. Basically, the more right. narrow the field. Yeah. And that's what I find like um, when talking with employment law, it's like these these clauses or contract clauses like have to be so narrow um, in regards to what you do. And otherwise they're they're quite difficult to uphold. 
on the backside, just because I think sometimes you also there's this other kind of um, part that plays in here is like you can't stop with someone from making a, or, you know, making a, like a, a business or making money. Sorry, I guess I'm um, providing their their income. So if that's the case, then, you know, you have to be very specific about what it is. So you're not infringement on, you know, their regular being able to like make an income. So it, it does play back and forth on both sides, just kind of like you said, you we work both sides. Well, it, it pays back on both sides to protect the employer, but also to impl- protect the employee from being able to just go out and get a job. So you can't be like, uh, this person can't work in 25 kilometers because that's an unreasonable expectation for someone to like drive an extra 25 kilometers to to get a job. So It may not be depending on the industry. Mm, um, right. Right. So it, it really depends. But I see I see clauses written by businesses that say you can't work anywhere in North America doing these things. I'm like, no, <laughs> anywhere in North, <laughs> North America is way too broad in geography. Um, yeah. They also get into trouble when they say things like including. You can't do anything including blah, 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 blah. Well, that's that's what else does it include? It's including. So it, you're saying that there's more things that it might, and it's not specific enough. Okay. Yeah. So wording is extremely important in there as well. Yeah. You shouldn't try to draft them yourself. But um, the other thing about <laughs> nor would I try. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing about confidential information that's important in any kind of health professional setting is you often have ethical um, and professional obligations to keep your client or patient. Uh, health information confidential. And so you can write in that if somebody is breaching confidentiality, that can be cause for dismissal. And that can be an issue if somebody keeps leaving patient records out where they can be seen by other patients and you've talked to them about it and you need to discipline them. It's good to have um, those kinds of provisions in your contract. So I'm going to really briefly go through a whole bunch of other key things that you might want to have. Term, fixed versus indefinite. That's cle- like clear why or what that is. Now, why? Why do you want um, an indefinite contract? Indefinite is what I, I recommend 99% of the time, even if you're hiring someone for a fill position. And the reason for that is there are so many ways to mess up a fixed term contract. And if you mess up a fixed term contract, you can owe someone severance for the remainder of their term. And if you let their term expire without doing a renewal or having another contract in place, you can owe them common law severance. So there's a thousand ways. <laughs> there's so many ways that you can mess up a fixed term contract. I generally recommend indefinite. Um, and then you just have a good termination provision. OK. Um, other clauses, obligations to former employers. So don't bring any confidential information from your own old employer over here. Why is that important? Because your old employer may sue me if you're using their confidential information as well as suing you, and I don't want to deal with that. Um, Job duties and descriptions and the ability to change them. So, you know, if you have a very specific list of job duties and then you want to add some duties to somebody's responsibility docket and they go, I don't want to do that, you're going to have a problem. If you say, you know, we require flexibility from our employees, we can change your duties, you know, from time to time, you're going to have a lot easier uh, time telling them, no, this is in your job duty or job description and you need to do it. Everyone has to pitch in and unload the dishwasher. Okay. Um, <laughs> the bane of everyone's existence in dental right. is actually literally cleaning up their own dishes. Like, I'm not even kidding. Like, most people can get through the day of, like, dealing with people puking on them or whatever. And then, like, but, like, if someone doesn't wash their own dishes in the back of the, back of the staff room, like, ready to lose our minds. Yep. Absolutely. Um, probationary periods. So those used to be a key provision. I don't actually recommend using them most of the time anymore. And the reason for that is a probationary period comes with it, the obligation that you give the person a chance to prove themselves in the job. And if you don't have a probationary period and you decide they're not a good fit for whatever reason and you have a good termination clause and you fire them within the first three months, you owe them nothing. So I generally recommend having a really good termination provision that ties that off rather than actually putting them on probation because probation has a whole bunch of law 
that's developed around what is a reasonable chance to prove themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas if you just let them go under the determination provision, you might not have to pay them anything. So I generally don't use them anymore. Um, oh, hours very of work. Interesting. And Yes, uh, it's not not every employment lawyer is going to have that same take on it, but that's mine. Um, hours of work and overtime, uh, that's pretty obvious if you have an expectation about hours of work um, and an expectation that they need to ask for permission to work overtime and then they're not asking for permission and charging you overall time all the time. You can say, hey, no, you don't have permission to do this. You have to seek permission and approval in advance. And if you don't, there could be consequences for that. Uh, compensation and benefits, that's one of the things that's always in there for the benefit of the employee. One of the things I like to put in is that the employer has the right to change the benefits package from time to time so that there isn't a guarantee about certain things. Vacation pay and sick pay, it's good to have that spelled out. Not everybody knows what their entitlements are on sick pay and sick pay is now required by the Employment Standards Act. Um, so having some parameters, parameters around that and saying things like we can require a doctor's note can be helpful to you if you need that. Um, this is the thing I said earlier that I was going to get back to. So contract implementation, there's tons of ways that people go afoul when they're um, trying to get someone to sign off on a contract. The number one uh, pitfall is that they give a new employee or they give the employee a contract and don't actually give them something of value for signing it. So if the employee's already started working with you, you need to give them something new of value in exchange for agreeing to the contract. If they haven't started with you yet, what they're getting of value is the job. If they've already started with you, you need to give them something new of value or the contract isn't legally binding, which means your nice termination provision may not be legally binding. Um, your nice, you know, clauses about non-compete may not be legally binding. So the co most common issue is that it's, there's an issue around when the contract is presented to new employees um, or current employees aren't given something of value. Some people write in the contract, as consideration for this new employment agreement, we're going to give you $10 and then they never actually give the $10. That's a problem. <laughs> yeah, because it's not a breach of contract then, well, basically. And it's no consideration. So the contract's not yeah. valid. Yeah. So make oh, sure geez. that if you're going to do that, you actually give the money. Um, okay. Um, then. Yeah. Um, when you're giving raises do you, or like changing your job description, if you're putting all that in there, then should you not be updating the contract at the raise time then as well? Yeah. So raise time is a really good time to do a review of your contract to see if you need to change anything or make sure that things are done properly with respect to termination provisions, et cetera, et cetera. It's a really good time to do a review and consider updating your contracts um, and make sure that your consideration is fresh. So if you are reviewing your employees uh, contracts and you realize that they signed it two weeks after they started and they're due for a raise, you can say, you know, we're updating our contracts. We want you to sign this. It's, you know, it, you're going to get your raise for signing it. Your raise will come into effect after you signed it. Um, you know, and so here it is, sign it. And then you're fixing the consideration issue you had before. And that's something that you can take advice from someone like me on to make sure that you're doing it properly. Um, but generally speaking, you want to make sure that they get something of value after they sign it. OK, one of the other really common ways that uh, people make a mistake is to have a termination provision that doesn't meet the Employment Standards Act minimums or other provisions that don't make the Employment Standards Act minimums. So I often see, shockingly oftenly see, um, <laughs> people who've cobbled together employment contracts from various places. They've made their own based on one they had and one their friend had and one they found on the internet. <laughs> and they use terms that are not consistent with one another. So that sometimes they talk about the employee as the employee, and then sometimes they talk about the employee as you. And then sometimes they talk about um, the employer defined specifically and other times more generally. And then they also do things like say, this is at will employment, which is not a concept that we have in Canada. At will employment is an American thing. That means we can fire you at any time and pay you nothing, not legal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not legal yeah, here not, so <laughs> not how we roll in Canada <laughs> so these cobbled together contracts 
are most of the time a really bad idea because you have this false sense of security that you have something that will help you and instead you have something with a whole bunch of below minimum standards that yeah, could get you, know you in trouble. I I find it very interesting, um, and dentistry specifically, how how um, the leadership team or the owners get so like hung up on paying for a lawyer, and it's like, you know, maybe it costs you two grand or something to like get all your employment contracts or whatever it is, and it's not. I mean, it's not cheap but it's not like unreasonable um for something along those lines and and then but then like are so upset when they you know an employee is in breach of contract and there's nothing they can do about it and it costs them two thousand dollars a day a day to like deal with this and then pay for like being sued or like all these other things that happen and I'm just like you could have just saved yourself so much time and money if you just put out a little bit in the beginning and then like just you know stayed on top of it or actively managed it um but i I also get on the empathy side of being um in that role it is it is a lot to to look at and deal with and think about and stay on top of too right it is it you know being a dentist as a full-time job and then being an owner is a full-time job and you're doing sometimes both of those things so I get it from so point uh, from both points, I guess. But at the same time, I'm like, ah, oh. like I have been in the middle of so many like not great employee employer situations, yeah. and having to like walk through that like line or you know landmine type of things that I just like am so grateful to have a good um you know, lawyer to work with to like help me go through this because I don't, like I said earlier, like I don't have the expertise to like, to lean right. on to like do this job. I can, I can execute plans in the, uh, you know, on the ground, but like yeah. when the field knowledge, I just don't have that same, same when it thing. Comes to, when it comes to costs and stuff, like if you're wanting to run a situation or a best Uh, you know how to deal with this by me sometimes it can be as quick as a 20 minute phone call and sometimes it can be an hour or longer depending on how messy it is and how much information I need to review in order to understand what the problem is but some of it's like you know you spend I've had clients who spend 20 minutes they they I charge them 20 minutes of my time and help them avoid a problem that's going to cost them ten thousand dollars right like it's 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 you know and let's talk about value that's actually my next slide so how much does it cost uh we used to charge a flat rate fee of two thousand it's just recently gone up um cost of everything has gone up and to be honest we were losing consistently at two thousand dollars on how much time um it took to create them for everybody um so we have a flat rate fee of $2,500 plus taxes. What does it get you? You know, it gets you a template that uh, has everything that you need. I have one that I generally start with for dental practices that includes things like, you know, hours, expectations, duties, responsibilities, termination, non-compete, non-solicit, all of confidentiality, all of those things. Um, and you know, what is the value to you? Well, most of my clients, uh, I get a lot of my employer clients um, when they come to me because they have a huge issue. So they come to me because they have an issue, they realize they don't have a contract and they've learned that they have 10 months of liability to do liability to this employee and they're flabbergasted and upset and this person has ruined their life and they're horrible to work with and they should have dealt with it they should have dealt with it you know five years ago and they inherited this person from the last owner and they've always been a problem like I've heard the same story so many times I just love that you framed up 10 years of dental in my life and literally that story is so true and and then you know I walk them through they're gonna have to pay to get rid of the problem right now and they're very sad and angry and you know we can come up with different strategies of dealing with it maybe they can give working modus maybe they can you know there's different things that they can do but at the end of the day they can't just fire them and pay them nothing 
Um, and so, or pay them very little. And so when I walk them through what their liability to someone who makes, you know, $70,000 a year for 10 months, when I walk them through what they're going to have to pay to get rid of them tomorrow versus what they would have to pay if they had a contract from me and only have to pay them eight weeks or, you know, like one tenth of whatever, two tenths, one fifth of whatever they were going to have to pay, then they have no problem queuing up for the $2,500 contract. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a small, like when you get into these situations, it's a very small piece. It's, it's just, also it is, it's like, like a small piece. Ha- having a template where you literally just plug in names and addresses and dates and some like specific information like hourly rate or whatever it is for that employee like it takes you a lot less time to write something than it does when you have to write something up every time you hire a new employee right Mm -hmm. you just have it and you fill in the blanks and you send it off and you're good um so and you get familiar with it i'm i'm sure that i'm I'm not sure if it covers this but i'm sure that you would um, be able to do this as like so when I roll out contracts, it's, I can read through it and break it down so the employee can have an easy understanding because it is a lot of legal terminology. So, so yeah, my, my template isn't um, a legalese document. It's a letter. Okay. Like and it starts with, a, you know, kind of a welcome to the team. This is the terms of your, you know, a employment agreement. You know, if you have questions, let us know. And it, it's written mostly in plain language other than where I have to use specific legal terms. I love that. So it it's trying to be accessible to everybody, not just lawyers. <laughs> I um, love that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. That's awesome. I mean, I I love how easy you make it. This is like the thing. And, and I feel like more and more dentists really need to like, um take advantage of a situation like this because it's this is not difficult and this is not something that is tricky to implement it's very step by step and once you get familiar with it it's really not that hard i know there's a little bit in the beginning of like feeling nervous about you know like you said i love in the beginning you're like oh like delivering it and there's like oh like awkwardness it's going to ruin the vibes of our first you know meeting or whatever but I just, I just don't want in the end for, I mean, for the team to be suffer because we can't exit someone the way we need to exit them. Or we, we, the person's not living up to the expectations and we need to deal with that. Or the opposite end where an employee is not protected either. If we do like a sale or whatever, and like, there's all this stuff that goes on. The employee contracts are so helpful for um, on both sides of the story here, like both both employer and employee. And you have just laid this out so great. And it's just so simple. Um, and you can obviously see all of the information here for to contact you, which I just love. Um, yeah, it, if you guys have any questions or if you need to contact, Christy's amazing and she can uh, give you everything there for you to like lay things out and enjoy the rest of um this meeting and you can reach out to us as well we can forward that information over to you does anybody have any questions was there anything in the chat no no i don't Let's think so. it comes up on my screen yeah okay awesome okay. well thanks so much christy for having Thank us you. on or for coming on and uh yeah i'll have everyone reach out to you if they reach out to me directly and um, this has been awesome thank you so much perfect thanks so much for having me take care yeah Cheers. have a great day bye. you too bye